asphalt concrete samples and extracted carefully sub volumes or meso volumes of the material. And again, what we're going to do is take them, uh, figure out how much asphalt we have in them, look at the uh, particle gradation using the scanning electron microscope technique. So we'll take these images and we get, this is the, the particles in that sub volume, and we can image this and get to the particle size distribution. And then from that, with the asphalt cement and the particle size distribution, we can get at factors like volumetric concentration of mastic. And what we find when we look at different materials is that this mastic distributes itself as a homogeneous material, which is good because that simplifies many of our uh, secondary step process, which is the process of finding what material we need to experiment on in the laboratory. And so when you do that, when you start looking at all of these scales and looking at the mechanical behaviors of each, what you find is that the behaviors scaling up are not linear. In other words, they don't scale proportionately to the aggregate size. And what this tells us is that there is some kind of fundamental change in the materials between this mastic scale and the fan. So here we're looking at modulus again. again frequency on the x-axis. So this is the same modulus curve we showed earlier, I showed you earlier. And we see that from binder to mastic, there's not very much change in the mechanical properties of the material. But when we get to from mastic to fan, there's a rapid and sudden increase in the material behavior. And when you investigate that further, what you find out is that the particles themselves at concentrations between these levels start to interact and contact in significant numbers. And that interaction occurs and shows up in the FAM scale. So what does this mean in terms of actually finding out useful things? Well, what it means is that this curve, this difference between materials, represents a change in the surface chemistry effects, or the surface chemistry interactions between the aggregate particles and the binder. The mechanisms that dominate this are different than the mechanisms that dominate this jump. Here we have aggregate particle interaction, structuralization, this kind of phenomenon that are building inside our body. And then from fan to mix, it's actually not that much of a change from the other. So you can imagine in this multi-scale perspective, if I can jump from here to here, using some kind of uh, physical mechanism, some model, and I can jump from here to here, then the leap from fan to mix would probably not be that much more different. So we look also at the damage characteristics. We see that the materials have different damage characteristics as well, meaning that the way that damage affects our modulus is different depending on the scale. And we consider that in terms of the upscaling process. Now I'll spare you some of the details, but what we're going to do now is take this, okay? In this test case, I'm going to take these two properties, and I'm going to take these two properties. And I'm going to try to go to the mix. Now, if I'm successful, what that means is that I could take my basic ingredients, my asphalt binder and my aggregates, and I could run my experiments on these two components only. That's all I need in order to get at these behaviors, this behavior and this behavior. And then, given the gradation I have for my mix, the other external factors, I'll predict how these behaviors occur. And you can do that because I'm showing this to you guys. I want to show you kind of the best case. But you can do it rationally in this modulus upscaling. So again, this is frequency at different temperatures. It's not a perfect match, but you generally get good agreement in upscale of the modulus effects as well as the damage effects. So what does this mean uh, for practical purpose? Well, I'll go back to a graph similar to what I showed before. So now, I'm talking about doing something called performance, performance-based mix design. Now when we talk about mix design, if you haven't already, you'll talk about it eventually, we do it based on volumetrics only. We measure out what's the percentage of aggregate, what's the percentage of binder, we put them together, mix them up, and we measure what the density of that material is, how easy it is to compact, but what we don't measure is how well it will perform with respect to fatigue, or how well it will perform with respect to running. And the reason we don't do that 
is here. With a, even a macro scale constitutive approach, timing-wise, that's three months. If you wanted to do it with a conventional approach, then you'd be looking at something more like, oh, four years. To do all of this experimentation on all of these possible combinations for a given source. But if you leverage our knowledge on binder linear scholasticity, mastic behavior, uh, mixed behavior, I can get it down to about seven days. Now, obviously, there are problems, right? It's not a perfect agreement. Here, it's not perfectly agreeing. But we could use this technique to possibly screen some of these, excuse me, possibly screen some of these 24 different mixes down to something that we could manage with reasonable actions. So these techniques offer us the ability to shorten some of our analysis time because, again, we're getting at trying to look at the underlying mechanics, underlying physics in the material. So what this is all about is something called a uh, technique using analytical models. Analytical models are models that are pretty simple to solve on a calculator and a spreadsheet or so forth. But the, the field is much broader than that. And some people are actually looking at uh, using what are called computational tools or computational methods where they'll actually take their concrete, asphalt concrete, and they discretize it into one of two things. They'll discretize it into the black stuff here which is asphalt matrix, just a matrix, and then they'll put the aggregate particles within that matrix. They're building a virtual asphalt concrete, all on the computer. They'll build all these factors, and they apply a multi-scale approach. So they'll take and do one scale with this two-phase composite, input the properties from the one scale and the other, and they can actually predict, you're able to predict all this white here are micrograms. Micro cracks that have coalesced and propagated and joined into macro cracks. And then, if you can do this virtual type of testing, you could simplify the mix design process without substantially increasing the time or cost requirement. So it's a novel technique, and it's gaining uh, some leverage or some traction in the area. So, so far we've talked about going from ingredients to mix. Asphalt concrete generally has one application. We use it to pave our roads, which is nice for a pavement engineer or a pavement materials engineer because we only have one thing that we have to really be concerned about. The problem is that one thing is very complicated, more so than many other structures. So the next logical step in a multi-scale approach is actually to do this pavement simulation, again, because we want to know how does the material perform in service. That's the ultimate goal for our engineering and that's important because we have different degrees of severity of cracking here we have a very moderate or light cracking all the way up to highly severe but we also have interactions between loading materials climate and structure this slide at the bottom shows you four different lanes or sections of highway they all had the same climate they were all in Washington DC they all had the same loading but if you can tell it's nice this is all wet so you can see kind of the the, the cracks. This one cracked severely, this one was kind of moderate to light, moderate again, and then no crack. All of this was because of the material. And it, this pattern showed up because for this particular structure, in this climate, for these materials, the fatigue characteristics were different. So we need tools or techniques that will allow us to assess these things before we have to build a pavement and just see what happens. Just the traditional approach. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning this unifying concept. Well, if you look at sort of the state of the art in pavement analysis, how this is done now, it's done in a few, a couple of steps. And I've outlined that this stuff is all in red, meaning we're using one set of assumptions and kind of broad uh, framework. And then in another step, we're doing a different set of frameworks. Here, what we're doing is mechanistic. We're kind of more fundamental at the top. We're taking our inputs, our structure, materials, traffic, climate, all of them primary factors important in pavements, and we plug them into this layered analysis. And then we take it out, and we take it across the hall if we want, and we plop it on somebody else's desk, who then start to do performance assessment. Then they look at how does the damage accumulate over time with all the loads. And then they finally predict using this kind of empirical relationship how much cracking will happen. 
Now the problem with this is that sometimes these two things don't really line up very well. And it's not rational. It doesn't make sense. Well, a second approach is a more mechanistic approach where we put all of this under one big blanket. Now we have our pavement, what we call a pavement analysis engine, which is driving all of this computational aspect. We're doing a pavement response. Okay, this is the simple constitutive relationship I showed at the beginning. Then we're going to look at damage accumulation. Same step as before, but now, instead of that summation accumulation, we're actually looking at the constitutive law for damage. And then we have distresses accumulating, how much cracking accumulates, which is going to be a function of the damage that I've already accumulated here. And this goes on and on and on for the entire paper line. So I'm going to do this for day one, hour one, day two, hour two, day two, hour three, all the way to 20 years until I predict my uh, paper line. Now the multi-scale aspect of this comes in to defining what is E and what is C. Because I define this now by using mixed level experiments. We can actually define that using the steps we've done before. Okay, so now I've measured the mastic and I've linked this analytically to the mix. And now I want to link it to the mix. And we do that with a second set of analysis tools. That's the pavement analysis engine I showed before. And the analysis engine that's typically used are finite elements. In a finite element, what we're basically going to be doing is building or, or separating our asphalt pavement into a series of little blocks. And the blocks are going to be combined together and they're going to be forced to kind of, as they deform, they're going to be forced to stick together. And that sticking together in the analysis drives the stresses and strains in our body. And we can do that to actually predict and look at uh, strains in this case in our pavement system. So what you're looking at here is a pavement. You can imagine this is a kind of a half of a pavement. You have a tire, in this case, sitting right here. This is the direction it's traveling. And you would run these simulations, and this is depth here. This is all asphalt concrete pavement. And you would run these finite element analyses. We'll do it. Oh, sorry. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, so you've got this pavement now, you see the, the tire going across. Okay, let me try it in this one, see if you can see it better. So in this one, the difference between these two are the behavior in the winter time is different than the behavior in the summertime. In this little, in this little uh, uh, silly putty example, summer, meaning the material is soft, so summer is, is illustrated by my little creep look. Winter would be represented by me bouncing the ball uh, on the table. And we see white means more strain. So because it's softer, we get more strain in the summer than we do in the winter. But the basic process of the tire going across the pavement is the same. So we have the pavement, again, being loaded with time. And we're going to look at these output as input. So the output from the pavement analysis, structural analysis, comes into input into our constitutive law that then drives damage accumulation over the years. So some examples of where this has been applied. This has been applied at something called uh, the Federal Highway Administration has an accelerated load facility in McLean, Virginia. What they do is they've got this big machine and it rapidly loads the pavement. So the idea being we can create a 20-year pavement in a mere year and a half or something, some kind of correlation like that. So they looked at four different materials, and then we applied these constitutive relationships to try to predict how well the performance will be, and it turns out that the agreement was pretty good in this case. Uh, we only have four points, but you don't tell people that all the time. You know, I'll pick up on that. Now you can also use this for a kind of practical approach. So many times as a pavement designer, we have different alternatives or different decisions we have to make. And those decisions might be thicknesses of our base layer, thicknesses of our sub-base layer, the type of material I'm going to use in my base or sub-base layer. All of these, what seem like mundane decisions that turn out to have a substantial effect on cost and on performance, with these kinds of multi-scale approaches by looking at the material and the pavement and their interaction together, you could actually assess which of these was more likely to perform better or worse, 
And then you